The Aggies added a big athletic tight end over the weekend in Trey Watson via the portal. And this tight end room is looking really good heading into the 2024 season. You are Locked On Aggies, your daily podcast on the Texas A&M Aggies. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome on in to Locked On Aggies. I'm your host, Andrew Stefaniak. Thanks for making Locked On Aggies your first listen every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself when you purchase a Jace case, providing you with a personal supply of five antibiotics that treat 50-plus infections. Get yours today at jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. So over the weekend, the Aggies added another player via the transfer portal in tight end Trey Watson from Fresno State. Looking at Trey Watson and who he is as a player, he's an athletic tight end. He can make some impressive catches. Six foot five, 245 pounds last season with Fresno State. So, of course, he was teammates with quarterback Jalen Henderson. He had 38 catches for 378 yards and four touchdowns. And I think that, you know, Trey Watson is a tight end that can come in and play. He's a guy who can come in and help this room. We've talked a ton about how Coach Colin Klein loves the tight end position. He loves to use tight ends. He loves to have different guys out there. He loves to... Uh, Use them to block, use them to catch passes. The leading receiver for Kansas State last season was a tight end, as I've said time and time again. So my point here is the tight end position has clearly been a priority for the Aggies in the portal. And I think a big reason why is because Coach Colin Klein plans to use these tight ends a lot. So having a room full of guys that you think can help, can block, can catch passes, is key in looking at this tight end room, I feel really good about where it's at. So, of course, you got Trey Watson, the recent addition. Then you've got Garrett Miller, the other portal addition from Purdue. I like him. Watching the tape, both of these guys can do, can and Garrett Miller and Trey Watson, the, the portal additions, both can block and both can catch passes. But just based off tape, I like right now, I like Trey Watson as more of the pass catching guy and Garrett Miller as more of the blocking guy. But as I said, both of them can do both things. So I am not, you know, I I won't be concerned if Garrett Miller goes out for a route or if Trey Watson stays in the block. You know, I think that both of them can do both things. Then you've got the freshman coming in, Eric Carner. You know, I don't know how much you see him. Then you've got Donovan Green returning from the ACL tear. It'll be interesting to see. Now, you got to remember that happened before the season starts. It's about a year recovery. So he's going to be good to go. It might take him a little time to get back into the groove of things, to get back feeling 100% and completely feeling like himself. But Donovan Green is, you know, as he was heading into last season is going to be my guy heading into this season. I think he is is going to be – I still think he's going to be an NFL tight end. I think he is an absolute monster in the making. I think he can catch passes. I think he's quick. I like everything about Donovan Green. Now, how he comes off that ACL injury is going to be interesting. We all know, you know, playing fantasy football, watching different things, a player coming off an ACL tear, it's sometimes going to take them a little bit of time to recover from that injury to get back to being who they are, being themselves, feeling 100%. Will Donovan Green week one against Notre Dame be himself, be 100%? And I I don't know. That is an interesting um, conversation. And, I mean, the numbers would tell you that, no, he's not going to be. He's going to need to work his way in and and get healthy and and get to feeling right. So, I I don't think that he's going to be feeling 100% immediately when he when he puts pads back on and he's good to go. So 
Um, but I still think that when he does get to being himself and get to feeling right and getting to settling back into playing, the Donovan Green is in for a big season. Then you've got Jaden Platt. You've got Theo as well. But I'll tell you, I don't. if I had to make a prediction, if I had to rank all the tight ends that I've named, I think that Theo is at the bottom of the list. I just don't. I just I thought you would see him carve a little bit more of a role last season when Donovan Green went out with the ACL tear, and that just really didn't happen. Now, I know Jake Johnson was here, and he's obviously left, and Max Wright's gone now for the NFL draft, and then um, you lose um, Garza to the portal. So you, I mean, there, there, some of the tight ends that were on the roster last year are gone from the upcoming roster, but I still just I still just have this feeling that. Theo is not going to have a huge role this year. And, and if they thought he was, why would they be bringing in these guys? So I, I've got a feeling you're going to see him not do a ton, but Jane Platt, I think once again, he's, he proved last year that dude can play. I, you're going to see him out there. You're going to see him playing some good football for this team. Um, it won't surprise me one bit to see him getting significant snaps. So I think this tight end room is stacked. I think you've got plenty of talent. You've got exactly what you need for this room to be successful. But like I said, the only thing that a little bit will shake some things up is Donovan Green's injury. You know, I like all of the talent and depth you have in the room. You have plenty of talent. This is one room now. I, I've, I mean, you go one, two, three, four, six deep in guys who I think can play. Um, and that's including the freshman corner and that's including Theo, but still, I mean, let's say that, um, Theo doesn't carve out a role and Eric Carner, uh, red shirts, right? You still got four guys in the tight end room. I just, I think this room is in a really good spot. You hate not having Max, right? He did so many things well, and you hate not having Jake Johnson. He was a really good tight end, but I like where this room is at heading into next season. I don't think you're going to see much of a drop off from tight end production. I think that having Donovan Greenback is going to be huge. I think that having um, bringing in these these transfer portal additions that do different things and and can help this team in different ways is going to be crucial for this fo uh, football team. So, yeah, I'm um I'm in on this tight end room, ladies and gentlemen. I think it's going to be a talented room. I think it's going to make this football team, you know, move to the uh, next the next level. And I also think that knowing that Coach Klein loves the tight end position, he loves feeding tight ends, getting the football to tight ends, um, using tight ends in different ways, having a lot of talented tight ends on this roster does not upset me in the least bit. So I'm happy with this room, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy with these additions. I think that the two portal additions are going to come in and help in different ways. I think they're both uh, versatile tight ends who can do different things. I like Watson as more of the pass catcher. I like Miller as more of the blocking tight end. But both of them, as I said minutes ago, can do both things. This tight end room is in a really good spot heading into next season, even with Donovan Green having to kind of get back from that ACL tear. A way too early SEC power rankings list came out. And I, um, I think it has the Aggies way Way too low. We'll talk about that coming up right here on Locked on Aggies. But first, I got to tell you about our wonderful friends over at FanDuel. The NFL regular season is wrapped up, and there's still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's 150 bucks in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there's so many different betting options. You, you can take over-unders on player props. You can take the over-under on the game. You can take the points. You can take the money line. There's so much stuff you can bet on on every single sport on FanDuel. It's a ton of fun to use. It's the app I use when I'm wagering on sports. It's just, it makes the game more fun. It makes the game better. You got to go check out FanDuel. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. So speaking of a layup, we are going to talk a little bit about Texas A&M's massive win over Kentucky in segment three. I'm excited to break that one down. Huge win to hopefully, well, we'll get into it. But 
I want to talk about this SEC power rankings list. Way too early, yes, 2024 SEC power rankings list. Um, first of all, I think that you could argue Alabama is a little too high. So the list goes Georgia, Texas, Ole Miss, Missouri, LSU, Alabama, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Kentucky, Florida, Texas A&M, Auburn, South Carolina, Arkansas, Mississippi State, Vandy. So the first thing I want to do here is go through the schedule because what, what, what stands out to me is how – let me pull it up here. So what stands out to me is how your games – Florida. so Arkansas behind you. Then you got Mississippi State behind you. South Carolina behind you. And then Auburn behind you. So all of these games here, Mississippi State, Arkansas, South Carolina, are your um, away games. I know the Arkansas game is neutral site, but, you know, away, neutral site. So Mississippi State is a road game. South Carolina is a road game. Arkansas is a neutral site game. Florida, who's just ahead of you, which is insane to me, but is um, your away game. So what I'm saying is, According to this way too early list, you're not going to play a single like top team on the road. All of the of the uh, tough teams you play, Missouri, who they have pretty high, they're at home. Um, LSU, who's pretty high, they're at home. This is what I'm getting at here. Uh, Texas, who's obviously pretty high, they're at home. All of your challenging SEC games are at home, and all of your more – uh, manageable SEC games are on the road, which is the polar opposite of what happened last season. Last season, all of the easy games, all of the not great football teams, you got to play at home. Then all of the good football teams, you had to go to their place. The real outlier last season was Alabama. You got to play Alabama at home, but then you had to go play Ole Miss on the road. You had to go play um you had to go play Ole Miss on the road. You had to go play Tennessee on the road. You had to play a whole bunch of talented football teams away from Kyle Field. And listen, that's just that's just how scheduling works. That's just going to happen sometimes. Sometimes you're going to play a schedule. You're going to play um, a schedule where in, in your favor. I mean, once again, I keep talking about Florida, but look at Florida's schedule. It is like the sad like, – I genuinely – I've never felt bad for another SEC team struggling. But Florida's schedule, it's almost just not fair. I mean, it really isn't. So, you know, you could have a schedule like that. The Aggies have a manageable schedule to that I think can, not only can it ease Coach Elko into being a head coach in the SEC, can it ease him into being the guy at Texas A&M, but also I think it can really, this team can compete right now. For a national championship, I don't know. For an SEC championship, I don't know. But this team, I think, can put together eight, nine wins this year because the schedule is so manageable. Now, it would take you beating a team you're probably not supposed to, and it would take you to, uh, it would it would take you taking care of business on the road against all of these teams that aren't very good. But you never know. Road games in the SEC are always scary. That's kind of my point here. Is you know, it's not going to be the the schedule is so manageable. I, it, and I think what makes me feel better kn knowing that is, you know, I, I keep bringing up the Florida thing, but imagine you're Coach Elko, right? Imagine you're Coach Elko and you're getting ready to play Florida um, or and you're, and, and you're the head coach of Florida, excuse me, right? And this is your first season. I mean, look at that schedule. Can you imagine if that schedule was your first schedule as, the, as, as, a, as a coach? So I think the fact that Mike Elko gets an easier schedule, it's an SEC schedule. You got to play Notre Dame. You got to play Texas. You got to play um, Missouri and LSU. It's not a cakewalk. No one's saying it's going to be, oh, they're going to go 12 and 0. It's going to be easy. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is comparative to some recent schedules last year's comparative to some other teams in the SEC, Texas A&M has a very manageable 2024 schedule, but back, to this power rankings list, you know, I don't 
I'm not a believer in Florida because, I mean, they've lost a lot of coaches. They've lost a lot of players. They lost, like, their whole recruiting class. Everybody headed out from Florida. Then you got Kentucky, and it's like they've done okay in the portal. You know, they they had a pretty good recruiting class. They bring in but, – but once again, their quarterback is Brock uh, Vandegrift from Georgia. Is he going to be good? Is he going to be bad? We have no idea. I have no idea. We've never seen him play. We know he was talented coming out of high school. What can he be now as a starter? We'll see. I have no idea. So, you know, and that's why I get – that's why it's way too early. I'm not knocking this list saying, well, we don't know if their quarterback's going to be good. It's way too early. But I, I have a feeling that – Texas a and will finish higher than both of those two teams for sure. Those are the two teams that I feel extremely confident Texas A&M will leapfrog. Now, I also, you know, here's the deal. With Saban retiring, Alabama, where they are in this list, I think is fair because it's still Alabama, and it's hard to be like, oh, Alabama, put them at 12, like, you know, new coach. It, it's it's fair where they are because it's Alabama. And they in, in kind of how I, I've argued, Texas a and is going to hold on to some talent. So, um, while Alabama, they're going to hold on to some of their talent. They'll hold on to some of their recruiting class. Not all of it. Like we saw Ryan Williams who left. Ryan Williams was the five-star receiver who was recently on a visit to Texas A&M. Not everybody is going to stick around. You're going to lose a lot. You're going to hopefully keep some. They're bringing in DeBoer, who was a coach. I was excited about potentially being the head coach of Texas A&M. Um, but I like, I like the hire we made. And it wouldn't have made sense to win all that time. I mean, you wouldn't have had a head coach till the other day because of – them going all the way to the national championship game. So, um, but yes, looking at these power rankings and in Tennessee is another school. They're sitting here at on this list. And I, I just look at Tennessee and I just go a lot of that is going to be up to a quarterback who hasn't really proved himself. Um, Nico, the five star that we saw playing the ball game for Tennessee. I think he could be good. I think he could be an elite quarterback, but once again, as I say all the time, we haven't seen him prove anything because he's been behind, um, you know, Milton. So, I mean, it, it to me, what I'm getting at here is I think that Texas A&M, obviously the portal additions make question marks. There are question marks because of all these portal additions. But, I mean, you know who your quarterback is, we think. I know that there's a lot of listeners that aren't aren't with me on the whole Conor Wigman hype train. But, um, but, I mean, you know, I feel pretty good about um, the quarterback situation. I feel pretty good about our, our receiver room, our tight end room, as I just got done talking about, the running back room. The offensive line is, is, is getting better and better. The defense, I feel great about the, the front seven. Your, your secondary is still a question mark, but you're making additions in the right places. I feel good about this roster. I feel good enough about this roster to say that I think that they could leapfrog teams like a Nick saban Alabama Tennessee, Kentucky, Florida, Oklahoma. We'll have to see what they do. They, you know, they lost a lot in the portal. So, no, it wouldn't surprise me to see the Aggies up number six at the at the real preseason or at the end of the season next year. I think this team is 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 Coach Elko is doing a great job bringing in these portal players, an incredible job bringing in tons of talent. I feel good about this roster heading into next season, and I have a, a very good feeling that Texas A&M is going to be ranked higher than 11th in the SEC when the season ends next year. The Aggies got a massive, massive, huge, gargantuan, giant win over the Kentucky Wildcats on Saturday. I don't know if I'd go as far to say season-saving win, but I think you could almost go there. We're going to have that conversation coming up right here on Locked on Aggies. But first, I got to tell you about our friends over at Jace Medical. I know we come to, talk to sports to escape from some of the crazy realities of life, but can we talk for a minute about preparing for real life? According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade. This is scary. I can't imagine the helpless feeling of a loved one being sick and there's supply chain issues that are keeping them from getting their life-saving medication they need. Thankfully, we'll be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, um, 
sinus infections, skin infections, among others. This could be, this stuff could happen to any of us, as we all know. Visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board certified physician, and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to jacemedical.com and use offer code locked on to get $20 off your first order. So, about this basketball game, the Aggies get the 90. 90- 792 overtime win over the Kentucky Wildcats. Wade Taylor, 31 points. Boots Radford, 28 points. So, you know, talking about this Texas A&M basketball team, it, it, the, the word I always use to describe it, well, I mean, it's multiple, but I mean, gritty, scrappy, find a way. Texas A&M, I would argue, Aside from the LSU loss to start SEC play, all of their losses are kind of understandable are against pretty good basketball teams. You know, they didn't lose to some random no-name school. You know, they've lost to some talented teams. The now I'm not saying LSU is not talented. And I mean, I mean, they just got their first loss to SEC play. They were two and zero heading into play Auburn, and Auburn got them, so they're two and one. But um, LSU was a little impressive to me. I thought they were going to be pretty bad, and they were okay. So. Obviously, um, you know, kind of blowing the Aggies out. But, I mean, Kentucky's a really good basketball team offensively. Defensively, they're atrocious. And I think what Coach Buzz Williams did is he said, he looked and he said, how can we attack this Kentucky team? We know they're bad defensively. We haven't been shooting the ball well. Now, they shot the ball better in this game. Texas A&M, I mean, Wade Taylor was making his threes. Boots was making some threes. Um, let me pull up the exact numbers. I didn't write down the numbers on um, for shooting for the day. Um, I'll pull that up right now. So the Aggies shot 40% from the field, but 37% from three, which was a step in direction from what we saw to start SEC play. Um, Wade Taylor was 6 of 13 from deep. It was funny. He only made seven field goals. But six of the field goals um, of those main field goals were threes. Boots was uh, uh, three of six from deep. And, and what was impressive to me about this win is, I mean, you know, Boots just put the ball on the ground and drove to the rim, and nobody was stopping him. I'm a believer in if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, in a game like this, you you, you knew you were you were kind of you were limping in, and, and you haven't been shooting the ball well. Well, you do an incredible job scoring around the rim, scoring the easy baskets. Three-pointers are great, but layups and dunks are better, in my opinion. And so that's why a guy like Boots Radford just putting it on the floor and saying, listen, I'm taking this thing to the hole and scoring. It was great to see. Henry Coleman, you know, he didn't – I mean, he played great, I thought, against Auburn. And then against Kentucky – you know, um, I, now once again, did he play? I mean, he was two for three from the field for four points. Only had one personal foul. He had two rebounds. Let's see if he had any steals or blocks. No steals or blocks. But I mean, he was coming off a game against Auburn where he played 35 minutes and he had five rebounds, 17 points, and it was getting to the free throw line. Getting he was doing. He, he played great in that game, and he didn't like I said, he didn't play bad. He just was kind of a non-factor. But, I mean, at the end of the day, Radford and Wade Taylor took this game over. They said, we're not losing this game. We need a quad one win. We are limping into this. We've lost back-to-back SEC games. The LSU loss I was, was ugly and inexcusable. The Auburn loss, I get it. Auburn's a good basketball team on the road, tough environment. You needed this win. You couldn't fall to 0-3 in SEC play because then we're starting to have conversations of, can you even get to the NCAA tournament? This is a is a season flipping win based on the way that you started SEC play. This win for the Aggies is so massive, and there were a few calls. That foul call on Boots, where the three pointer went in and stayed in the net. I mean that, you you know. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and get into the to the ref talk. Well, I'll do that more in college um, basketball than I will football, and I'll do that more in baseball when we get talking about baseball. I am not. I am. Um, I like the chirp blue. I did not like when an umpire missed calls. So we'll that'll be conversation for a few months away. But 
Um, I mean, looking at this, like I said, I feel really good about this basketball team after securing a win like this over a really good. I, I personally think Kentucky is one of the best teams in college basketball. Defensively, they have to get better, of course, but I think that they're a really good team with some guys who can score, talented young players, a classic John Calipari coach basketball team. But I'll tell you, I think that Texas A&M, you know, here's the deal. What is Texas A&M good at? They get offensive rebounds. What are they doing this game? They had 25 offensive rebounds. Heading into this game, Texas A&M was number one in all college hoops, grabbing offensive rebounds. We all know how good they are grabbing offensive rebounds. But they were number one, averaging 18 a game. They had 25 in this game. It felt like every single possession, Texas A&M got two or three opportunities to score the basketball thanks to incredible offensive rebounding from everybody. I mean, I mean, listen to it. Uh, Rad, uh, Boots had four offensive rebounds. Wade Taylor had four offensive rebounds. Oh, no, I looked at it wrong. I was looking at defense. Uh, Radford had five offensive rebounds. Levesque had five offensive rebounds. Wade Taylor had two offensive rebounds. Um, Washington had four. Garcia had four. Uh, Carter had an offensive rebound. Everybody was grabbing offensive boards, and it's what makes this team so good and what makes this Texas A&M team one that you don't want to mess with because – if they are shooting the basketball, if they are making their shots, they can beat anybody thanks to their ability to clean up. They're going to get second, third opportunities pretty much every time possession down the floor. So that is what makes this team so great. Quad one win over Kentucky. Massive, massive win. Now you go to Arkansas. Then you got to go to LSU. Then you got Missouri at home. I think you got to go two or three there. In all honesty, I think you got to find a way to win all three of those games. You're a better team than all three of those teams. Arkansas is really, really awful. Tough place to play, but they're really awful. I think the fans are going to kind of, you know, they might be getting close to done mentally there. So go get three wins in a row. Get this uh, record right and, and get yourself hot heading into the tournament. This team can do it. This team can be really good, but they got to keep uh, start a winning streak and keep it going. That's going to do it for today's episode of Locked on Aggies. Thanks so much to you every day for being here. I really appreciate it. More uh, playoff NFL football coming up tonight. That'll be fun. Hope everybody enjoys that. I know I will game at 4.30 or 3.30, depending on where you are. So everybody look forward to some playoff football today. That's going to do it for today's episode of Locked on Aggies. Hope everybody has a great rest of your Monday, and we will see you tomorrow.